So first of all, let's talk to about, about November. When you were last year at the beginning of November, one thing that's changed since then is the stock market. It really took off at the end of the year. It's been a, last year was a little bit quiet in mergers and acquisitions. Does that make a difference in your business? Well, one of the interesting aspects of the prices going up is I think the multiples in the U.S. relative to multiples on some of the non-U.S. exchanges are much higher, which creates a nice arbitrage opportunity, which I think maybe we'll see more cross-border M&A. This year was very busy for us on cross-border M&A. So we could, we're seeing one, companies listed outside the U.S. just migrate to another new listing here and turning it into their primary listing, getting a multiple bump. bump. But we could also just see a lot of U.S. companies spending their cash overseas because those earnings, you could pay a premium, but still you bring those earnings back and they're worth a lot more here. And then I think we may see some companies back into a U.S. listing through stock combinations. So you have your, you're listed outside the U.S., do a stock for stock combination with someone listed here, get into that S&P 500 and all of a sudden you've got a better multiple. So it could lead into some nice cross-border activity. Ethan, you may be being a little modest. Are you number one, according to Bloomberg, on the tables, actually in cross-border? Yes. Yeah, okay, you may as well say that. I'm going to take the credit for it. So one of the things we talked about was actually how you finance these deals, whether they're actually arbitrage on, on multiples or otherwise. How are you actually financing these days? Because when we last talked, you said it's largely equity. Right. I mean, look, the secret sauce of an M&A boom has got to be leverage. And so just looking at private equity, you know, we're going to be topped out at deals around $4 billion if all we're doing is, is these equity backstop deals. So last time I was talking about the private credit markets, I think we've got to get more fluent and better using these private credit, and meaning that what I call the mosaic capital structure has to start being used more. And by that, I mean not just the private equity side, that topping that off with some family office and sovereign wealth money, but then also building out the capital structure with creative instruments that take, it, uh, take into account rating agencies, cash flow needs, and a lot of money flowing into this cr private credit space. We have folks coming in who kind of stayed more toward distressed investment before. Now they're getting into the more refined, genteel M&A space. So we've got to start using that mosaic capital structure more fluently. And if we could get there, yeah. then we could start seeing deals over $4 billion in the LBO space. I'm curious as to why we haven't seen that, at least not in mass. So right. Far. It's hard. Yeah. You know, it's not. Also, it, there may be a little bit of a fear. These guys are not as friendly necessarily if things go south as your bank syndicated bank loan uh, lender. Mm -hmm. So if we start to see defaults, that could lead to some more hesitancy. Uh, it's also not so easy. It's not as intuitive. It's easier to go to some of the big, you know, guys who syndicate big bank loans like J.P. Morgan, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there's work there. But I see the investment banks are now referring deals back to their in-house private credit. Mm -hmm. uh, so we could see more. One headwind on that could be there's this Financial uh, Standards Oversight Council right. and a Stability Oversight Council. Yeah, SOC, yeah. yeah. they've in introduced at the end of last year some proposed rules to basically treat a lot of these large private credit funds like banks. If that starts to happen, yeah. then we could you know, have all sorts of regulatory requirements which would put the brakes on some of that exuberance. Well, on the topic of regulation, in addition to whatever uh, FSOC actually does come to the table with, we've already seen regulators at least try to get in the way of some of these big deals with varying degrees of success here. Is that regulatory overhang, meaning from an antitrust right. perspective, is that still an issue? You know, I think Buyers and advisors are feeling really solid right now on antitrust, notwithstanding the headwinds. I think the playbook on how to fight, how to move quickly, how to not agree to timing agreements, how to allocate risk in the agreement through reverse termination fees tied to regulatory issues, not give away too much in the allocation on the buy side. I think that play, those playbooks are all worked out very nicely now. And they're also, folks are finding spaces like cybersecurity, and renewable energy where there's not so much trouble on the regulatory side. So yes, we don't know about all the deals that aren't happening, yeah. but when folks have their eyes on a deal, I think they feel like the playbook and the avenue is there and they know how to fight. You think we spent a lot of 2023 paying attention to the Fed uh, and watching them raise rates and then anticipating them cutting rates. Right, right. now, the markets seem to think there's gonna be cuts. How does that affect your business? How important is it for people considering these deals to sort of think they know where the interest rates are going? Yeah, I think the more important fact is getting the bigger checks. And I don't know if the syndicated banks are ever going to start writing bigger. They got burnt so badly in 2022 
And all last year we were saying, when are they going to start writing larger and larger checks? And there's a lot of hesitancy there. You know, I think you're going to see people come in and they say, well, there's a lot of portfolio companies which have to be flipped. And even if you can't get a great rate on borrowing to buy these private equity portfolio companies, that that will happen anyway. But there's so much going on right now in the, what I call secondary liquidity transactions, where you have these private equity funds owning all these portfolio companies, and they're taking out NAV loans, different types of investments, so that they can return money to their limited partners without selling the portfolio companies. Now, whether limited partners are going to tolerate incurring all that debt, we'll see. But that provide, that's a real headwind for doing M&A because you could just borrow at the high level. Ironically, one area where we may see mergers as a result of that is um, between fund managers, right? Because <laughs> it's easier to get these, and it, these loans, these investments in the fund manager if you have a bigger, more robust portfolio. So to optimize your ability to take advantage of that, we may see the fund managers start to combine.